appreciate your presence here this evening. We have a uh, wonderful crowd and uh, many visitors, and we appreciate that so much. Realize that there are many places that you could be this evening, and um, you chose to come and to worship here and to sing with us and to praise God and to pray, and we're thankful for that. Uh, some of you have driven quite a distance to be here, and we appreciate that. This evening, uh, we'd like to discuss with you about a woman's encounter with Jesus, and this, I'm sure, is a familiar passage to most of you, but it's found in John 4. If you'd like to take your Bible and read along with us, we'll be reading from John 4 about this woman's encounter with Christ. I've often thought about encountering Christ and what it would have been like in the flesh. Uh, all of us, of course, have encountered him, those of us who have been baptized into his death and his burial and his resurrection, you and I have encountered him. But what would it have been like to be able to sit on a well curb a long time ago and converse with the master? Wouldn't that have been something? To be able to speak to him and to ask him questions and to listen to, uh, to what his reply would be. That happened to a woman 2,000 years or so ago. While she was sitting there or coming to the well and Jesus sat at this well and he asked her a question. Let's read the passage. It's found in John 4 beginning with verse 1 and we're going to read ver through verse 30 thereabouts. So bear with me on the reading but I believe that it's important that you and I familiarize ourselves with this passage. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John Though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he may, must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him. And he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There are many questions that you and I could ask about this passage. Many things that we need to discuss, but obviously we don't have time to discuss all of them. This is a lengthy encounter that a woman had with Jesus at this well many years ago. She spent time with a master in the flesh. She asked him theological questions, and he answered. He showed her about his past, or about her past. Some of the questions that I have uh, 
found to be interesting in my study of this passage is, number one, uh, the living water. What is the living water? Jesus said that it is within you. And another, uh, later on in two chapters over, Jesus said that it is a well of water. And he called it the Holy Spirit. In this passage, he calls it a well of water springing up in everlasting life. All of those are interesting questions. All of those demand answers. Another question that I find interesting is why was it important for Christ to reveal this woman's past sins? And why did this woman, once this revealing of her past sins, why did she want to get into a theological discussion? I find all of these questions interesting. I find it's most interesting uh, for us today is to ask the question, what does it mean to worship God in spirit? And what does it mean to worship God in truth? I wonder if we studied this passage and if we could spend all the time, if we could answer all of these sufficiently. Within, uh, and I'm not sure that we can. I think there are some of these questions, though, that you and I must answer. Some of these questions that we can answer, that the scripture teaches us plainly, perhaps all of them. Why does Christ reveal this woman's past sins? I want to tell you, it's extremely important that you and I come face to face with who we are and what we are. And the Bible makes that plain. Jesus tells us that except we repent, we will all likewise perish. Perhaps in the past, maybe we haven't preached repentance enough. Jesus preached repentance. Jesus taught the need to repent. You know, this need goes all the way back to Jacob when he wrestled with, a, with an angel all night. And Jacob asked this angel, he says, bless me after they've been wrestling all night. I wonder if we've ever wrestled with God about who we are and what we are. And the angel tell, asked Jacob, he said, well, tell me your name. Don't you, know, don't you think that the angel knew what Jacob's name was? I believe he did. But maybe Jacob really didn't know who he was. So he says, my name is Jacob. You know what Jacob means? It means heel, cheat. Jacob had to come to grips with who he was and what he was before God could bless him. The same is true with this woman a long time ago sitting at this well curb talking to the master. A lot of our past we don't want to admit. It's a terrible thing, some of our past. Some of our past we wouldn't want to reveal to anybody, and we don't even want to reveal it to ourselves, and we don't want to admit who we are and what we are. But I'm going to tell you, when you come face to face with the master, he asks us to do that. He demands it. So here's a woman that had been married five times and was now living with an old boy. Wasn't even her husband. The scripture teaches that. And Jesus says, go call your husband. <laughs> now he knew. And he, he makes it plain that he knew that she had committed adultery several times. You and I have to come to grips with our past. I find this passage most heartening and most encouraging. Because I look at this woman who lived a long time ago, who was nothing more than a Samaritan woman, and she says that plainly. She says, I'm a Samaritan. Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans, but the Lord did. Even to the chagrin of those who were around him watching him, Jesus still had something to do with her. Though she had been married five times, he still had something to do with her. Not only did he have something to do with her, but he offered her salvation, the living water. So Christ reveals this woman's past because Christ seeks the sinner. He's constantly looking for the sinner. Luke 7, verse 39 says... 
Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Jesus sought the sinner, even the woman that came and anointed his feet, and old Simon the Pharisee sits back and says, what's he doing allowing her to be in his presence? Jesus said, I came to seek the sinner. That's who I'm looking for. So I find this heartening tonight because if you're sitting here in sin unforgiven, it's you that Christ is seeking. It's me and my sin. It's the forgiveness of our sins that he seeks and longs to impart to us. What? What, how much more encouraging could it be? <coughs> Mark 2, verse 17 says, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no, need of the, have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. <coughs> what keeps so many people from coming to Christ is their own view of their righteousness. When I can see who I am and my failure in my life, then I can turn to Christ. <coughs> but until then, I can't. So much of the world today, they refuse to look at themselves and they'll want to focus attention on someone else. But when I can see myself for who I am and what I am, and I can cry out with the publican and the sinner, and the sinner that cries out, instead of the publican, and say, I'm thankful I'm not as other men are, and I can cry out with the sinner, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. <coughs> it's then we can come to the forgiveness of Christ, but not until. It's only when we can see our need. No one ever comes to Christ except they see their need. No one ever repents of their sin except they see that awful sin that is in their life. And the Master, fortunately and for us and by His grace, seeks the sinner. The lessons that we can learn from this short uh, study, and for us, for me and you, is first of all, no one has gone past Jesus. I'm thankful <coughs> for that. As long as you're living, as long as you have breath, you have not gone past Christ. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how vile your past is. Jesus exposes the, uh, this to, uh, with, with us, with this woman at the well. She had been married five times and was living with a man. <coughs> now, in anybody's book, that's not a moral life. But Jesus calls her to purity. He calls even a woman like that. Secondly, you and I, if we take the lesson of the woman at the well in John 4, and we reverse it and put ourselves in the role of Christ and the commission that he gives us, then you and I should never discount a person because of their past. So often, you and I are willing to write someone off and say, they're just too bad. And I don't want to have anything to do with them. No one has run past Christ. The gospel is for all. And has to be for all in order to be for anyone. And Jesus offers salvation even to those who have made a complete mess of their life. That's the hope. That's the hope for me and for you. And what a wonderful lesson we learn from that short dialogue with this woman at the well, there are many other lessons in that. Many, much, much more lessons that you and I don't have time for. I'd like to focus on uh, one other this evening. I want to talk about worshiping in spirit, and I think this is important for us. I want you and I to learn what this means. I believe that question can be answered. Now, the question of worshiping in truth Surely you and I understand the value of truth. Nothing of any value in this life is, is, uh, is uh, worth anything except it be based in truth. Nothing 
is of any value whatsoever except it be based in truth. That's also true with our service to God. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 9, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The contrast of that is teaching the truth and following what God demands and what God <coughs> requires. So you and I understand that, hopefully. The question that many of us don't understand and the thing that we struggle with is what does it mean to worship in spirit? We see the need to follow God's commandments. The honest person sees that. Now, we may quibble and squabble over what those commandments are, just as this woman at the well did. And that's basically why I believe what happened with her when Jesus revealed that her past sins and the sin that was had taken over in her life let me divert that attention just a moment, Lord, and let's talk about some theological question that I've got, and I want to discuss that with you. So she says, our fathers say that, we're, uh, that uh, we are to worship in the mountain. Your fathers say you worship in Jerusalem, which is true. Just for the record, just for the record, the Jews were right. <laughs> but you know, Jesus didn't deal with that very much, did he? He didn't deal with the theological issue. He didn't with, with this woman. He was, he was seeking to save her soul. And the first step in that is seeing who you are and what you are and your need for the Lord and forgiveness of sins. I asked the question last night. Do you really want the law to be enacted in your life? Do you really want that? I don't. I want grace that I can do my life. If the, law is, if the law is put in action against me, <coughs> automatically, I'm condemned, no matter what. If I have failed in one, I failed in all. So I'm not begging for this law to be enacted. So when this woman is quibbling over with Jesus over this theological question of where to worship, Jesus says, let's go to something deeper. Let's go to the heart of the matter. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just truth, not just according to the commands of God, but there is something else that is required. <coughs> so our text reveals Jesus in making a contrast of what this woman is asking of a theological question that her forefathers uh, obviously argued over for many, many years. And the issue goes all the way back to Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And that argument goes on, and they're arguing over that and arguing over that. And Jesus tells this woman, he says, the time has come. That they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus is revealing the contrast between Old Testament and New Testament worship. Have you ever had somebody tell you that I don't know about you folks over there, y'all just seem dead to me. Because you're not shouting and you're not hollering. You sit there like a, a, a knot on a stump, <coughs> not on a log. Uh, well, what's wrong with you people? Don't you have any spirit about you? When I hear someone say something like that, I know automatically they don't know what Jesus was talking about. They don't have a clue. They don't understand what it means to be to worship God in spirit. What their mind and what their idea of thinking is some mysterious movement that comes into a church that causes the person to get real emotional and to operate on their feelings and somehow this spiritual mystique takes over in their life. And these feelings rule and this spiritual movement rules. You know, this is, this is not uh, uh, excluded to just, uh, confined to just Christianity. <coughs> Why, the, all religions across the world uh, are defined in most, in most religions as a spiritual movement. Have you ever noticed that? And that's the definition of it as far as they're concerned, whether it's uh, someone worshiping uh, a Hindu god or 
worshiping in some Eastern religion of, of uh, karma. It's all, it's all defined to them as some spiritual movement that we cannot see and that affects us and we suddenly become spiritual and aware. I want to tell you, that's, just, that's not what Jesus is talking about. And we can understand that when we start seeing the contrast that Jesus makes. In light of this discussion that has started with this woman, our fathers say that we're to worship in the mountain. You say it's in Jerusalem where you're to worship. Tell me, which one is it? So Jesus tells her the demand that God is making. And it's the uh, worship in spirit. Many people think that to worship in spirit means that I'm sincere. I've had people tell me that to worship in spirit meant that you put yourself into it. You ever heard anybody say that? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't put yourself into your worship. Absolutely do that. And I'm not saying that there's not uh, emotions attached to worshiping God. We are human beings. We are emotional beings. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that's not what Jesus is talking about, however. To worship God in spirit. Sincerity was always demanded in the Old Testament. Sincerity is demanded in the New Testament worship. Let's notice in Isaiah verses one, uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. <laughs> Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, your new moons of your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What's wrong with these people? Well, you can't say that they're not offering sacrifice because they are. And the Lord said they were. They're bringing all the, uh, the, the bullocks and their, all the blood, all of the sacrifices, and the Lord says, I'm tired of it. They're a great disdain to the Lord. He hated why? Well, I'll tell you because they lacked understanding. Now, they were doing some things, but they lacked understanding. Their moral lives were, rep, uh, were, were awful. God ultimately destroyed them. The sincerity was lacking. They were sincerely wrong. They lacked the sincerity that went in the love and the mercy. You know what God tells Hosea in Hosea 6 verse 6? After Hosea learns the awful lesson of what it's like to have an unfaithful partner, and God has had an unfaithful partner with Sodom, with the children of Israel, they may have carried out some of these sacrifices, but their faithfulness to him was far from being close to what he wanted. And Hosea, the right, sits down in his empty home with his wife run off from him and taken up with another man. And God's prophet writes, and Jesus quotes from Hosea himself. Hosea writes, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, if you'd known what this meant, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guilty. Jesus also writes, go learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. 
He quotes two times from the book of Hosea. You and I might have sacrifice to God, but the mercy may be lacking. And the sincerity in the spiritual worship that God requires. God is contrasting the Old Testament worship versus New Testament worship in John 4. He continues in this passage, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What a wonderful lesson for us is to learn the sincerity is not just in a practice but also in every day of our life. To start living a life of sincerity toward God. God has always demanded sincerity. And for me to say that to worship in spirit would, uh, would, it would not be accurate if I said that it did not include sincerity. You need to be sincere in your worship. And as you come and you worship God and you take the Lord's Supper, sincerity should be at the, for at, at the forefront. But not just an action that demands going through a procedure, but a way of life. You see, that's what Christianity is. Christianity is a way of life. It's not something that we do. That was the children of Israel's problem. That was Sodom and Gomorrah's problem. They may go through the the vain actions, but yet, if the, their life is not involved in it, to worship God in spirit then becomes something much more than just actions. Christianity is not something we do, it's who we are. So the question is, is who are you? When Jesus revealed this to the woman at the well about her past sins, he revealed who she was, and he also revealed who she might be. As you and I look at ourselves, when we examine our life, we have to ask the question, who are we? What defines us? How is our life defined? Someone once said, you know, a good question to ask is if you were arrested for being a Christian and you were put on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Who are you? And what are you? Consider spiritual worship, if you will, in, uh, in light of Hebrews 9. And let's turn there. And let's read that briefly. <coughs> Hebrews 9, verses 1 through 10. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot, and had manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant. And over it uh, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests made always into the tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying the way into the holiest of all, was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure, listen, which was a figure for the time then present, and which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make the, him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Jesus contrasting 
worshiping in spirit and in truth, the Old Testament versus New Testament worship that he demands. Hebrews 9 verse 10 says, that which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washing, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Old Testament worship consisted entirely of physical things. It, 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 it entirely consisted of going through a lot of physical motions. Jesus says that the time has come and now is that they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Notice the contrast if we look at the New Testament worship that is demanded of us today. That Jesus said is now is versus the uh, carnal worship or the physical worship in the Old Testament. Worship in spirit is a spiritual worship. Let me say that again. It is a spiritual worship. We can better understand that by understanding what Jesus is teaching by using language, I believe, that we uh, can, uh, that use every day. Many people have taken this worship in spirit and tried to impose some mystical uh, action. But it is a spiritual worship, which would mean that it's not a physical worship or a fleshly worship. Our worship today, and that the time has come, does not deal with anything that is involved with the flesh. Romans 8 says that the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In the Old Testament, everything was carried out in a physical manner. You take, for instance, the tabernacle itself and the structure of the tabernacle. And we read in Hebrews there where the, the structure of the tabernacle was exact. And it was made with gold. And it had uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant and Aaron's rod that budded and manna from heaven. Everything was physical and people could see it and could touch it. Today, Jesus teaches us, and the scripture teaches us, that our worship is a spiritual worship. How is that so? Well, today, the temple that is involved and the tabernacle that is involved is nothing spiritual or physical at all, but it's spiritual in nature. As a matter of fact, you, as a Christian, are the temple of God. It's not a physical structure. The scripture teaches us that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I know that a lot of people in times past have been really concerned about buildings and all of that. And I know there's a necessity for a building. But not for worship. <laughs> you just don't have to have a building to worship God. I believe that worship services have been carried out throughout time without the physical structure of a building, and our building is not what uh, is, is the center part of our worship. As a matter of fact, you and I, as spiritual beings, encased in this physical body that the Bible calls a tabernacle, which is a tent, that, that becomes the object that is worship, that is worshiping. Our worship comes from a spiritual nature. There's nothing sacred about this building. We don't know that. Deep down, we know that. There's nothing holy about this physical structure. What is holy is each individual. Because we have been called to holiness. When we leave this place and we go out into the mission field of life, we're going out as a tabernacle for God. We're going out as a witness to Him is one that can offer sacrifices of spiritual nature. Notice what Paul writes in Ephesians 2. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, to the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are building together for habitation of God through the Spirit. Think about your uh, each life here today. We're constructing a building. 
God has constructed the building. Let's say it properly. And this building is the building of God where Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. One building block is no more important than the other, but we all go together to compose this spiritual building. Each one of us become the temple of God. It's no longer with a physical structure. And the contrast that Jesus is making is, you see, we need to be worshiping and we must worship God the spiritual in nature, not carnal. This whole world faces these issues. In 1990, my uh, company sent me to Japan. Japan is a nation that we missed the boat on after World War II as far as evangelizing. Hopefully there'll be a future time that we can do something there. In Japan, everywhere you go in Japan, there is a structure that's been built. There's a big Buddha, there's a little Buddha, there's a mid-sized Buddha, there's Buddhas everywhere. And these statues, and these little open air worship areas, they call it worship areas. I don't. I call it idolatry. It's what it is. Every Sunday afternoon, because of, and it's still this way, every Sunday afternoon, after they've worked all week and they work long hours over there, they'll go out and they'll go shopping with their family. And all day Sunday is a shopping day. While they're out in this uh, shopping spree, the Japanese will go into these open air places and with the big Buddhas, the middle Buddhas, and the small Buddhas and all this, and they'll throw in oblations to this to these shrines. And they'll donate some music <coughs> to them. And they'll say a prayer to them. And they've accomplished in their minds what they need to do. I called a uh, a fellow that had been in Japan over there doing missionary work. He was, uh, his family, some of his family was in our area and they gave me his number and I called him and, I, and he said, I've been over here 35 years. He said, these people can't see it and they can't touch it. He said, they don't want it. Sounds like America to me. <coughs> sounds like, it sounds like us. We want something that can be seen and can be touched what this woman was interested in. That's the question she was asking. Where can I carry out these oblations? Where can I carry out this worship? And what do you say? Jesus said you need to be worshiping God spiritually. It has nothing to do with our physical uh, worship. Notice, if you will, in the New Testament, all Christians are priests. In the Old Testament, the contrast is this, is there were special men that were selected. The Levitical priesthood is the example that comes to mind first with all of us. These men were set apart. They couldn't even own land. They couldn't work. They were set apart entirely to carry out the sacrifices that were necessary. The children of Israel, all the other tribes, had to keep them up. And that's why tithing took place. And so the Levitical priesthood could live. So God demanded a church tax so that they could live. Do you realize today that you're a priest? You are. The spiritual nature of our worship becomes clearer and clearer. All people still try to cling to the, to the carnal and to the physical. But the truth of the matter is, you and I are priests, 1 Peter 2 and 5 says. You also, a lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You realize when you come to church and you come to worship, and you're worshiping God in spirit, that you're offering up a sacrifice to God. When you kneel in prayer, you're offering up a sacrifice to God. When you perform good works, you're offering a sacrifice to God. Why Paul even writes that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, he tells us. So you see, our worship becomes spiritual in nature, and it becomes clearer and clearer. It has absolutely nothing to do with feelings. It has absolutely nothing to do uh, or entirely to do with feelings or some kind of mystique that surrounds worshiping in spirit. Our worship is spiritual in nature and not carnal. When we can understand that, we can better understand our worship. In the Old Testament, they had latched hands. They burned incense to God. You could smell the incense. You know, I've often thought about the, the sacrifices that were performed at, uh, am among the Levitical priesthood and the children of Israel. And these men worked all day long, and they, they sacrificed every day. And the stench had to be terrible of those animals that were dying and bleeding. And then mixed inside this stench of blood and sacrifice would be the sweet smell of incense the burning of candles. And that would prevail. Oftentimes, you realize that today the scripture teaches us that our prayers, our prayers are an incense to God. Revelation 5 and 8 illustrates it this way with the church. And when he had taken the book and four beasts and the four and twenty elders, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them hearts and the golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Prayers and saints. Our worship is spiritual in nature, and you think it is a comparison of the Old Testament and the burning of incense when you pray. Our prayers are not put up to God in the same way that those that incense being burned in the Old Testament. Except today, we're not worshiping for the physical things of candles and incense. We're worshiping God spiritually. In the Old Testament, they had instruments of music. David played the harp. I think there's a gospel song out about that. It's been, it's been out a long time. David played the harp. He did. And you know, in the Old Testament, that was perfectly okay. I don't think that was condemned in the Old Testament. I think, as a matter of fact, it was sanctioned. I think that they were supposed to do that. David was a man after God's own heart. And you know, he would assemble psalteries and he would assemble harps. He would assemble all the singers. They would do all these things and they'd play this music and they'd play it to God. But you know, if we worship God spiritually, we don't worship God that way at all. That's a physical thing. You know, when you play a, a, an instrument of a, an instrument of music, Today, the instrument of music that we are commanded to play is the strings of our heart. We are to pluck those strings. We are to pluck them with our voice and with our, uh, and with our lips. I want to tell you something tonight. You know, as I listen to the singing and as I participated in the singing, it, uh, it, it becomes ever so clear to me that we miss, we miss worship when we sit and we don't sit. God commands us to sing. Now, I'm so thankful, Craig, he didn't command to sing well. And he doesn't. But I hear the singing. And I know that God is ordaining that because it's spiritual in nature. Now, playing, on the other hand, becomes physical entirely. So God today demands those commands and demands those that worship him must worship him spiritually. Not physically. As they did in the Old Testament. Ephesians 5, 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Make singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I want to tell you, if you refuse to sing, you refuse to worship God. A portion of the worship that's demanded. I want to tell you, you need to sing. You must sing. It's part of worship, and it's part of, and, and the, the heart strings that you pluck 
and that you make this melody to the Lord. They are accepted by him, no matter if you're off key or not. It doesn't matter. But it's spiritual worship that God requires today. And finally, in the Old Testament, they offered animal sacrifices as part of their worship. They physically did that. <coughs> I don't think we could overstress how awful that must have been. I just can't imagine. I can't imagine having to having to have, have having to do that. Sacrifices were made every day. Now what we read was made once a year with a high priest going into the most holy and offering sacrifices for the for all the people. But people made sacrifices every day. And I'm thankful that our worship today can be spiritual in nature and not physical. Because we learn and we read tonight that Christ entered into one time. One time. And he offered sacrifice for you and me that is sufficient. And our sacrifices now become something spiritual in nature like the sacrifice of the sacrifices that we offer become spiritual in nature, like the sacrifices of good works or the sacrifices of worship. That we give our body a living sacrifice. But the sacrifices for our sins, we can't do that. Just can't do it. And it's not even required of us. Because Jesus went in one time and he offered sacrifices. When he died on the cross, his blood, one drop of his blood, was more valuable than all of the animal's blood that had ever been slaughtered. One drop of his blood was more valuable than all of the animal's blood that could ever be slaughtered. And he spilled his blood for you and me. And for me now to deny the fact that I must worship God spiritually would be then to deny the fact that Jesus sacrificed for me. If my worship becomes that that is entirely of a physical or a carnal in nature, that is concerned with fleshly things and worldly things, then I might as well go and start offering sacrifice because I need to do that too. Hebrews 9, 14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? His sacrifice was sufficient for us. For all men of all time, of all ages. Finally, I want to leave you with this passage. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill. And in Acts 17 there he says, You men of Athens, I can see that in all things you're too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I came upon an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you. Paul's day in Athens there on Mars Hill is not a lot different than people today. <coughs> well, there's no statues in America. There's a lot in India. There's a lot in many places in this world. Our statues in America may take on a different look. I don't know. I guess so. What do you think? The Apostle Paul tells us spiritual worship. He says in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein seen, that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with man. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Our Lord requires of us sincerity of a spiritual worship coupled with truth and enveloped in truth. Tonight, as we have worshipped God, I believe we have worshipped Him in truth. As
as temples of God, as high priest or holy priest that God has made unto us with Jesus Christ as our high priest, we worship him. We worship that which is spiritual in nature. If you're here this evening and you are in need of Jesus Christ, you come to him in faith. You come to him repenting of your sins, recognizing who you are and who you are. Make that good confession that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And submit yourself to be baptized with him, such a spiritual picture that God offers to us of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Entirely spiritual. If it's not spiritual, then it just becomes getting wet. <laughs> but being spiritual, then we understand that we are baptized in the Lord. And we're raised to walk in a new life. And our sins are forgiven because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And being in contact with his blood. If you're here and you are in need of the Savior, you're in need of forgiveness of your sins, we offer the invitation. If you're here and you would desire the prayers of the church for whatever reason, won't you come? <coughs>